Hi, everybody. Um, this is going to be hopefully the first in a few um, different times that we'll be able to talk to you. And despite everything that's gone on in the world, we feel that it's still important. So we're just going to kind of go ahead and uh, jump in and take you on what we would have done through um, school, which um, is kind of a walk through um, Auschwitz and stuff like that. Um, and Matheny and I are going to do this together. I'll start us off, um, but you'll hear kind of both of us throughout this. Um, and I'm just going to kind of jump into it. So first thing I'll say is this, because it doesn't seem appropriate to do anything other than start here, which is this is the gate of death. I've shown you guys this before. This is the entrance to Birkenau. Hopefully you've been reading Night, and as you've gotten to, Elie Vassell got to Buna, at least, um, in that. And um, while Auschwitz had thousands, and I'm not joking when I say thousands, that's not even a Doranesque exaggeration of subcamps with it. Um, you can look that up. Um, the three main ones would be Auschwitz I, which was really the original penal political prisoner, labor camp, etc., etc. Birkenau, which was the death camp. This is the entrance to Birkenau. And then Buna, which was the work part of Birkenau, which is where Elie Vassell would have been. In, um, and we'll show you that on a map later. And so this would have been what people would have seen as they came into Birkenau. And it got the name of the Gate of Death because this is the gate that two and a half million people who died at Auschwitz passed under. The train would have stopped roughly here, and then they would have taken about a half mile walk down to the gas chambers or so. They had no idea where they were going, and as you can find pictures of and stuff later, you will sometimes see little kids just kind of skipping down to the gas chambers, not knowing what's going on. Um, eventually, though, um, people began to understand what was going on here, how this was being used, and it was given the name the Gate of Death because that's what most people ended up when they passed through. Hey guys. Um, so the picture that you see on the far left, the statue on the left, is actually in Berlin in Germany. Um, we saw this picture when we were in uh, Berlin in 2018. Um, it's a picture that showed uh, a group of people uh, that were headed uh, either on a train to hope or on a train to death. Um, because that subway station that we had just come out of in Berlin um, took people to both of those places. Um, so that was a very origin point of their journey um, and really reflected people's lack of understanding of where they were headed in a, in a terrifying way. The second couple of pictures that you see on this slide are uh, taken in Krakow in Poland. Um, and they are a modern art sculpture in a square that was used to keep people, to hold Jewish people in pens before they were sent to camps, um, to Auschwitz in particular. It's a modern art sculpture, public art nowadays, to remind us of what it was that happened there. And each individual empty chair <clears throat> in that square reminds us that 10,000 Jewish people left from that square and were sent to their deaths as a result of the Nazi occupation of Poland. It's a lot like that scene in The Pianist Guys where they're in the square right before him and his family are sent. Now they're in uh, Warsaw, so they would have been sent to Treblinka. But like, think of it the same way, where they're all sitting there debating what they're going to do. They split up that caramel. They all have no money, et cetera, et cetera, all in this square right here. This would have been in Krakow, and it would have sent people to Auschwitz. Okay, guys, this next slide, um, there are uh, three things I want you to see on this. Um, the first is on the right, um, gives you an idea of uh, why Auschwitz was um, the, the factory of death that it was. And really, it was a complete um, con convenience of um, transportation. Um, Auschwitz, hap Auschwitz happened to be located um, on a bunch of rail lines that literally could get you um, almost anywhere in Europe. Um, and you can see all the way from Paris, uh, all the way over to um, Oslo up there, all the way to the east, all the way down. Um, to the Balkans, etc., etc., and um, a lot of times the Nazis just told the Jews they needed to resettle. I mean, if you can imagine this, people from Paris and Amsterdam and places like that, more in the West, in the East, they just took the Jews out and killed them and shot them and stuff like that. But in the West, they tried to be civil and kind of this masked thing for them. Could literally buy first class or business class tickets to Auschwitz um, on the train, and so it was really the train line that made this um, so convenient. Um, the top just shows you the uh, Polish name, which is something along the lines of Auschwitz. I'm not going to say that correctly, um, but that was just the town. Auschwitz is the German name for it. And then on the left, you can see the um, areas that I was talking about. The bottom is Auschwitz I, the main work camp where the prisoners were and stuff like that. The top would be Birkenau, the main death camp. There's about a mile and a half in between the two or so. And then Buna, which you can't even really see on the map, where Vassell would have worked and stuff like that, um, would have been kind of in the top right corner or so um, there, just to give you an idea or so. This picture that you see here um, is a picture of the entrance to the village at Auschwitz. Um, Arbeit macht frei, the three words that you see here, are a lie. Um, they are 
ironic in this case. They're a way that the Nazis sought to manipulate those people who were coming into Auschwitz um, with the promise of hope, um, a hope that almost never proved to come to fruition. When you go into Auschwitz village, I think I expected it before I saw it to be sort of like a ramshackle and rushed village. Well, you think, I mean, they just did this hurriedly or something like that. Right, but, but it's didn't. actually brick constructed, all of the same type of style, and nothing looks hurried about it. It looks incredibly planned, um, and it is almost, to a certain extent, German picturesque architecture. There's not a whole lot to say um, on these next slides. I am just going to sit here and let you guys look at them for a second, though. Um, you see the guard towers, and then you see kind of like the entrance and the um, the kind of, uh, um, uh, what's the word for it, uh, barbed wire and like electrified fence and stuff like that that would kind of come in. And this is the first things, of course, after the gate that you see as you enter um, Auschwitz one. Um, these next um, slides, though, this next picture, though, gives you way more of an idea of what Matheny was talking about, about how stylized it was. I mean, this looked like a town, and I actually remember, um, if you remember Matheny, um, partway through saying to you, like, holy bleep, like, this whole thing is actually like a village, not like a camp or anything like that. Um, you can even see, I mean, it's it's got its own um, consistent font, as you pointed out, yes. right? Like The lighting, the sconces are all matching on each building. And so to me, it, I had, I think even wanted it to seem like something that was rushed and hurried, but it looked incredibly planned. Well, and it speaks minds, uh, or sorry, it speaks volumes about, um, this kind of mind blowing, um, general plan Ost that the Nazis had and how, how thought out and how systematic it was and how they, they meant to, um, kill via work and extermination here. Um, and you can see the buildings are all exactly the same. That happens to be block 24. Um, today, each of these houses, a different kind of aspect of Auschwitz one. Um, and uh, as you'll see in the next one, um, this aspect right here, for example, um, gives you an idea of, um, of like what um, two different types of rooms that prisoners would have had in Auschwitz one. Um, so like, for example, over here, you see it looks exactly the same as, um, as um, the one in, uh, I'm looking on the far left, sorry here, but it's, it's block 24. You can see the style's exactly the same, continued up just like a village here. Um, in the center, you've got like the kind of standard prisoners' rooms before it became overcrowded with like Soviet prisoners' war, stuff like that, um, that would have been like bunked in there and then they would have been basically worked to death. And on the right, you've got the rooms of like, you know, a capo or possibly somebody who was a prostitute, somebody who for whatever reason would be treated a little bit better um, than like other people because the Nazis wanted them for some reason or found them like success or found them like helpful or something along those lines. Um, but this just gives you kind of an inside idea of like, you know, the situation that these people um, were in and what life was kind of like in Auschwitz one. Now this looks bad, not, not absolutely horribly horrific, but really bad. Um, as our guide pointed out at the time, um, Auschwitz one, um, Birkenau makes Auschwitz one look like a five-star hotel. Mm -hmm. Like this is the nicest it's ever going to get mm -hmm. for these people by far. Okay, so this um, next picture you see here, this would have been the um, execution grounds at Auschwitz I. Remember, for the first few years of its existence, Auschwitz I was mainly a political and, um, uh, you know, undesirables camp. Yes, there were some Jews and stuff like that, but it was way more directed at, like, homosexuals or Jehovah's Witnesses or something along those lines, um, as well as political prisoners and stuff like that, as well as just Russians and other people they wanted to eliminate. Um, and what you're looking at um, here with the memorials is this is the execution grounds um, of Auschwitz. It's one, not where they gas people or hang them, but where they shot them, um, which would have been generally what would have been considered a quote unquote more honorable death, if that makes sense, and reserved for um, political prisoners or people who like, you know, were criminals, but like had just upset the Nazis in that way, not in the kind of like, as they would have said, like, quote, scum of the earth way or something like that. And on the left is where this is the women's execution ground, where the women would have had to strip naked of all their stuff and stuff like that. And then they would have been taken out to the right and summarily shot. What we see on this side, guys, on, on the left-hand side, and you can actually see Mr. King in the picture. That'll give you a sense of how tall these buildings were. Um, but on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, these are pictures of a courtyard where the Nazis did roll call for the prisoners at Auschwitz. Um, when the Nazis did roll call, they were made. the prisoners were made to stand outside in, in 
all amounts of temperature in, in any sort of condition. Um, and oftentimes they were tortured and shot or made to watch people be tortured and shot. Well, and usually if, if one person messed up roll call, then they'd start again. So they could make this thing take six hours in the pouring down rain if they wanted to just to upset the prisoners, right? Yeah. Right. Oftentimes, um, people were made examples of, prisoners were made examples of during roll call. If someone, for example, had taken an extra piece of bread or um, had attempted on some level to to make life better for another prisoner, um, they might be hung. Um, in the book Night, in Elie Wiesel's book memoir Night, um, several scenes took place that you see here. Uh, there is a scene where the young boy um, is hung and is almost unable to be hung as a result of because he's so weight. small yeah exactly and that would have been on these poles right here exactly um so this is the actual location where we read about uh in night um also thinking about the scene in night where the soup imagery comes to pass where he uh, watches someone who dies attempting to get soup and and then ultimately we find out that the nazis used people in their soup that they fed yeah. to the Jewish people. Um, that is also. And if you, if you think that was like metaphorical when he said the soup tasted like people, it, it, it wasn't that that's, that's one of the things. I mean, the, the, the abhorrence of the Nazis knows absolutely no bounds as we'll continue to see as we go through this guys. Um, these are more pictures of kind of the square and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but then um, in the back right here, that chamber right there, that is the gas chamber at Auschwitz One. okay? This is not, just to be clear, the main gas chamber. This is not the gas chamber that millions and millions and millions of people died in, and two and a half million at Auschwitz Two. That gas chamber was destroyed by the Nazis in their attempt to cover it up. We'll show you the ruins of that a little bit later. This is the systematic killing that occurred at Auschwitz one so not to trivialize it in any way whatsoever but you know there were about 250 to 500,000 people depending on the numbers died right in here or so um, and we'll take you inside to see in a second this is what it looks like from the outside though um, the next part is the inside of the crematoria and the gas chambers there um, in the upper left would have been the actual chamber itself um, unlike um, the chambers at um, Birkenau or even places like Dachau, um, usually um, the prisoners at Auschwitz that were gassed um, were like sentenced to death and knew exactly what was going on. So this was not a like fake out shower like they did at Birkenau. Like um, at other places at Dachau where the gas chambers are still alive, you can actually even see the signs where they painted shower Rausbad, which is like shower for German in it, right? That's, that's not here as much. But the top left would have been the place of execution or murder to be honest it's not really execution it wasn't legal um murder and um then um on the right and at the bottom um would have been the crematoria and you can see that they're um big enough to put a couple of bodies in stacked and then they would have burned um that way um now the nazis went to this method they tried a bunch of different um things um for the most part originally the move was just to take them out into the woods and shoot them um, other times through Action T4, as we talked about, they began to experiment with gas and stuff like that. Um, as I mentioned in class, they eventually went to gas because um, Heinrich Himmler specifically um, went out to one of the killing fields to check out um, their progress of killing the Jews um, with guns. And he found that um, the sight of a bunch of people being dead um, made him puke. Um, with the guns. So he decided it would be significantly better to gas them. And that's, that's why the Nazis eventually moved to gas. And that's when these got built. And I think <clears throat> one of the things that um, is a really powerful scene in the movie Schindler's List, if you've chosen to watch that, another film, not one that we've always shown in class, but if you have some time, um, is the scene of ash raining down um, across places in Europe that are still moderately functioning. Um, so many people were murdered, and then so many people were burned in the crematoria, but ash actually kind of came down from the sky in a variety of European cities. So what you're seeing here is an actual problem that the Nazis had, the disposal of all of the bodies um, once they were gassed. And if you're sitting at home and you're looking for something to do and you're looking for a creepy, bizarre world, I highly recommend you check out the Amazon series, The Man in the High Castle, the one that postulates what would happen if the Nazis won the war. The reason I thought about it now is there is one very disturbing but very telling scene in there where they're driving through Alabama and the 
ash is raining down in the same way it did through large parts of Europe. Um, now, having said that, um, the ideas in this film or the TV series or the book are also fairly fascinating. And if you are trying to find like kind of a way to enrich this that we wouldn't do in class um, and you don't mind watching, you know, a, a somewhat violent series, um, by all means, check it out on Amazon Prime. Just know, guys, also that you'll study the Pacific theater of the war your junior year. Um, so just know that the man in the high castle also does kind of deal with the Japanese side of the war. Yeah. That we won't really cover. This year. And it does deal some with the Japanese atrocities too, mm -hmm. which are not to the same systematic scale necessarily, but equally as brutal and arguably to the same systematic scale. That's another story for later. Okay. Um, so the next series of pictures begins in Birkenau. Um, and you can see, um, the uh, the entrance kind of right there. Um, the long gap is the distance kind of between um, Auschwitz um, one and then Auschwitz two Birkenau, which is where the killing um, hardcore took place. This um, so so what happened was this, and I'll give you a little bit of background here. Um, in 1941, Reinhard Heydrich um, chairs something known as the Von C Conference. Um, w a n n s S E E, I think, though I might have spelled that slightly wrong. Um, the Von, Von C is just a suburb of Berlin. Um, it's the place that it took place. Um, and here, um, the um, final solution to the Jewish question is decided. And a number of things are proposed everywhere from putting them, not joking, on the island of Madagascar um, to um, exiling, exiling all the Jews to Siberia to, to mass extermination. And it's here that mass extermination is decided. And so in January of 41, when Von C occurs, it's um, after that time that the Germans um, begin the final solution, and that's the result of which is Birkenau. Um, Birkenau is one of seven death camps that occurred. I hesitated on that because the number is debatable. For years, people said there were six death camps, but as scary as this is, within the last seven to eight years, one to two, depending on your point of view, new death camps have actually been discovered. We didn't know they existed because there were literally no survivors. Um, of the seven death camps, six of them are in Poland. There was Auschwitz, Treblinka, Treblinka Sobibor, Klomo, uh, Majdanek, and, and Belzec. And then the other one, Malia Trastanets, in um, Ukraine would be outside of Belarus. Um, those were the main camps that involved the final solution to the Jewish question. Um, other camps were work camps, and then you had a third type of camps, like, for example... Like a transfer camp. A, a transfer camp, mm -hmm. like Terence thought, outside of Prague, right? Absolutely. Yes. Transfer camps were really interesting because um, sometimes one of the survivors that we had had that came to visit us, um, she actually survived as a result of the fact that her stepfather was in charge of as a Jewish person of aspects of working at a transfer camp. And he just, as a scheduler in this transport camp, he just never scheduled Sophie to get on a transport. And as a result of that, was able to keep her and her parents alive. Um, so transport camps were um, a place that were not specifically designed for labor or death, but they still were Nazi owned and Nazi operated. But this, a picture of the Gate of Death, again, was one of the seven death camps. And if we haven't made this clear, or you didn't know from this from the thing, Auschwitz was the death camp. I mean, this was the biggest of all death camps. This, um, The stats on this keep going up and up, as we've discussed. Um, currently, um, the stats are six um, million Jews dead, uh, between three and five million other undesirables, however you want to say it, um, quote unquote, people dead. Um, so that's eight to 11 million dead. Auschwitz to Birkenau, just Birkenau itself is responsible for at least one and a half, probably more like two and a half million of those itself. Okay. So that's the kind of extent of the killing that went on here. Um, this next slide, I think the picture on the right again is uh, zooming in at, at Birkenau, that gate. Um, and that's where Elie Wiesel last saw his mother and sister Zephora. Uh, the selection that he describes where Mengele told him and his father to go in one direction. And he says, I never saw my mother or sister again. Um, that was right there at this, at this scene. 
Yeah. His mother and sister would have had to go down the um, way, down the line, um, to what would have been the gas chambers. I mean, you can see just kind of the flat, open space that Burke now was. It was chosen for that reason because it made it really, really hard to escape. There's literally nowhere to hide. Um, Ellie and his father would have been sent over to Buna and to some of the, like, housing places that, like, occurred for people who were still kind of working in that area now as i said buna itself is kind of hard to get to and far away you have to be there for a while and part of it's been destroyed um but the next slides we're going to show you give you an idea of what the like conditions at birkenau which would have been pretty much identical to buna i mean it's the same camp it's just like half mile down the distance with a slightly different name um would like would have been like here Um, this is the open kind of entrance, the beginning of this, and you can see those wooden things. These look way more hastily built as a kind of like, you know, mm -hmm. not a like systematic like thing that we talked about at mm -hmm. Auschwitz one, but more of a, okay, we're trying to kill as many people as mm -hmm. possible kind of factories here. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that surprised me most um, about the intentionality of this killing um, can kind of be seen in this picture. What you're seeing here is uh, the inside of one of the uh, places where Jewish people slept. Um, and one of the things you can kind of tell is that there's a slight slant to the way the beds are constructed. And it was thought that if they had a slight slant to them, they could fit one or two more people on each bed um, in order to pack people in for, for sleeping between their times of labor. Um, so the intentionality and of the uh, sort of mass amount of people they were attempting to hold and then kill is, I think, exemplified by that architecture. Yeah. And at the bottom, guys, you can see the uh, the communal kind of toilets that um, existed, if you want to call them that, really just kind of holes. Um, part of the problem, though, um, was the amount of disease um, that was rampant throughout um, Birkenau in particular because of the complete lack of conditions. I mean, you thought conditions at Auschwitz didn't look good. As I said, this is absolutely abysmal. <coughs> um, and so you had, um, you know, as one as one thing said, almost everybody had dysentery. You had um, people who would um, literally have accidents um, from the top bunk that would drip down on other people, as gross as that is. Um, you would have um, other types of, like, rampant diseases, cholera, et cetera, et cetera, and the latrines, and then various things would spread there. Um, yet at the same time, um, because of this, um, none of the Germans would go into any of these places. So a lot of these places became, like, the perfect place for Jews to be able to do things like conspire. And they did attack like one of the gas chambers at Auschwitz mm -hmm. one time um, mm -hmm. to create art, to pass messages, to send things, to keep any amount of humanity alive. Um, these became one of the few places that it was possible to actually do that. Um, this next slide is a picture of one of the replicas of the cars. Up top, you can see the only picture in this entire slideshow that I didn't take or Matheny didn't take when we were at Auschwitz. And that up top is a picture of the kids just kind of like skipping literally their way to the gas chambers. Um, the Jews would have been brought in here. Um, that's where the car was placed um, and the picture is taken from. And you can see um, on the bottom left the entrance to what would have been like the people who were lucky enough to survive selection, if luck's the right word for it. Um, and that's where they would have kind of existed, where Ellie and his dad would have been, for example. Um, and then from the cars, they would have um, walked down to the gas chambers, and what they would have been told was it was time to take a shower, that they were going to be put out into, like, you know, a work camp and stuff like that, but that they needed to shower and get more comfortable and stuff like that. And then they'd walk about a mile and a half down. And the picture on the top right is a literal picture that was taken by one of the SS guards um, of the kids just going down to what they thought was their shower. They had probably about 15, maybe 20 minutes left on Earth. I think the thing about this picture that's most poignant to me is that I remember not so much I mean, I obviously remember standing next to it, but I remember how it smelled oh, looking yes. at this picture. And as we got closer, it, it, you it know, started to smell. From about the cable car on, you started to smell. At the beginning, it was sound, It felt like a faint burning smell. And then it got stronger and kind of more unavoidable. And so what we want you to understand looking at this picture is this is one of the bombed out crematoria. 
Um, and it smells like death. There is no way to describe it other than the smell of death. It's a smell I hope you never really smell, actually, in your life, other it's than in, maybe looking at things through history. And it's still, you know, the, the factor of death was so productive that the, the scent lingered for us in 2018. Oh, yeah. And it's not one of those, I mean... If you remember, guys, um, when talking about Versailles, I told you that some people say that Versailles still smells because of where people peed because they couldn't open up from Louis. But students will debate that. Nobody debate that this smells. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely has this just unmistakable mm -hmm. place that that mm -hmm. where between a million and a half to two and a half million people died. Mm -hmm. um, there were upwards of four crematoria at any time. Um, at least one was attacked, and they were never operational. Two were the main ones. Um, but the Nazis made sure to try to cover um, up their crimes, that they bombed out large portions of this thing. And so this is all that you kind of see of the bombed out crematoria here. Um, there's a little bit on the next slide. Okay, so this next slide right here is um, a further picture of the crematoria that were destroyed. As we said, there were as many as four, but at least, um, but only two really worked at any given time. Um, and the place that we were in and the time we were in, it was in February, um, and it was absolutely freezing. And as I said to Matheny at the time, nothing grows here and nothing ever should as kind of a memorial to everything that happened. But as you pointed out, um, it really kind of puts perspective on on how difficult this would have been in the short kind of rags and, and like, just, It you was know, freezing. Sheet. It yeah. was freezing. And we were in our full, you know, thickest possible boots and coats that, you know, we could get at our sporting goods stores and we were still chilly. Um, and we could only imagine what it was like if you just had a thin pajama yeah. and that was your issued clothing. I mean, this is partially, this is a, this is a very cold part of Europe where very little life can survive naturally at that time. Um, on the left, you can see, um, kind of one of the things you can see down in the, uh, um, the, um, uh, Sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, down in the actual crematory and gas chambers itself, it's really kind of the only part that's preserved. You couldn't see it very well because of the snow, but all it really is is rubble down in there. So, um, But it just gives you an idea of kind of the distance of that and the length of that. And then up at the top is um, an example of um, what Zyklon B, the gas that they would have dropped through, looks like. The Nazis tried a bunch of different ways of killing, as we discussed, from shooting to gassing to different things like that. And they eventually settled on this type of gas for two reasons. One, it was cheap to produce, and two, it wasn't so poisonous to the other parts of the body that they couldn't then use those in different ways, and we'll talk about that later and kind of the violations of the victims afterwards. Um, but it was also a very, very slow death. Um, it was not, that part was not considered at all. Um, they would have dropped the gas through, and then it probably would have taken between 12, 15, maybe as long as 20 minutes to die. And in places like Dachau, where you can still go in the chambers, you can see claw, or not claw marks, but like nail marks and stuff like that. It looks like that on the side of the wall and stuff like that where people are suffering suffocating and trying to get out of this as they like kind of slowly die here one of the ways that they used those villages the brick buildings at auschwitz was uh, to show exhibits of what it was that was looted very much looted from the jewish people and, and the other people that were victimized at auschwitz um the picture that you see on the left-hand side is a picture of, of eyeglasses, just thousands of pairs of glasses um, of people that were taken to uh, the chambers. Um, on the right-hand side, you see shoes, and you see the varied types and, and kinds and sizes of shoes, everything from, you know, bright red strappy sandals, you know, showing that people had no fundamental understanding of where they were where they were going or, or what they were headed to, to, to children's shoes, to work boots. Um, we also see in the center prayer shawls, um, Jewish prayer shawls, uh, that were eventually used as rags, disrespectfully, uh, by the Nazis. So the Nazis very much attempted to take what they could from their victims um, in order to manifest its use for the Reich. Yeah, and they'd re report it so that nothing was ever wasted in the Reich in any way whatsoever. Um, here you can see um, a room full of suitcases or so, everyone with a name on it, everyone with a year that someone was born. Um, so if you look at the one in the center, it says born in 1939, which means at best this, this person was three to four. I mean, at, at worst, at, at best, this person was six when they came to Auschwitz and most likely died. And you can see examples of, of children's clothing that was recovered and found and stuff like that saved by the Nazis. The Nazis would have saved any clothing that their victims had, any jewelry, any gold, 
any watches, any anything, any false teeth. They would have knocked their gold teeth out, stuff like that. They would have melted it down. They would have used it in different ways. They would have taken the leather. They would have reapportioned that. I mean, as our guide said, nothing is wasted in the Reich under any circumstances, especially when the war is in full view. But even then, and it just kind of depraved, like we're not going to waste anything, this whole like idea of autarky here. And what they said as well is that they found rooms and rooms of this. And when I say a room, I mean probably about half the size of our block room. So pick one size of the block room and think of that full of suitcases, full of shoes. And they, and they saved enough to document it, enough to make sure that people like Holocaust deniers that you might have run into on the web couldn't legitimately say these type of things without you know, just being completely wrong. Um, but they had, they found way more than they saved, way more than they kept, way more than they had. They just, they kept enough in order to kind of show and document. And this next picture, which is really one of the more tough pictures that we see as we go through, is a room full of human hair. And you guys heard that 100% right. Um, hair taken from people when they were alive, hair taken from people after they died. Um, and then used in ways to make mats, to make rugs in the Reich and stuff like that. And you want to talk about whether or not people knew what was going on as it was going on? It absolutely knew. There are other pictures you can find online of like, here's a ton of human hair that on it, stamped on the outside says taken from KL Auschwitz, right? And it's sent to a factory in Germany, right? And like, then it's used to make a rug or stuff like that. There are stories of like people looking for skin in order to make a purse or a wallet or something like that, particularly tattooed skin had more of a like better like you know it could be found better or better used or stuff like that i mean like they, this was literally seen as like you know taking almost sport from animals if that makes sense in the primary sources packet um that we would have used if we had had time to do all of our unit in class um you'll see a couple of sheets of paper labeled nazi medical experiments um and you can understand a little bit more about what Storn's talking about specifically um the purse skin situation there I think the other thing to consider with this hair, you know, when you look at that, you know, most men at the time did have short hair and most women at the time, you know, would have had long hair. So I think what you're seeing here is, you know, really on some level, a, a, a nod to the number of women, right, that did die here. When you also think about how little hair someone's whole head of hair actually produces, um, then this helps you get a sense of, of the massive scope of, of death, um, at the camps. Yeah. Um, these last couple of photos are, are kind of memorials or stuff along these lines. Um, the first thing you see there looks like a gallows, and it is. Um, it was on these gallows that the commandant of Auschwitz, for the bulk of the time that he that the camp was open, a man by the name of Rudolf Hess, H O E S S, not to be confused with Hitler's personal secretary, Rudolf Hess. Um, uh, Rudolf Hess was um, hanged by the Polish government. He was handed over at the end of the war. Um, this is a man who literally fits the definition of psychopath in every sense of the word. Um, at the Nuremberg trials, um, somebody said to him, Mr. Hess, you're responsible for killing uh, two and a half million Jews at Auschwitz. And he said, no, 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 that's not right. I only killed about two million. The other half million died of like disease and starvation. Just said it as if it was a number, literally right there. And so he was um, given over to the Polish authorities, and um, he was fittingly um, hanged within um, feet of the um, uh, crematoria and gas chamber um, at Auschwitz I, um, which he was then, according to at least rumor, though nobody knows for sure, cremated in that and then um, scattered afterwards, and the gallows in which he was hanged is still there. Um, the second to last picture is a thing that comes right as you walk into the entrance to Auschwitz, and it's a memorial that they said where they basically just took a scoop from the ashes of the blown up crematoria and stuff like that at Birkenau and put it into a um, memorial, not to represent um, any person, but just kind of represent everything that occurred and everything that happened there from like the destruction of the crematoria to the people to everything else. And it says 1900 to 19, or no, sorry, 1940 to 1945 right as you walk in. It's really symbolic because so much was lost. You can't really convey the entire scope. So to have this primary source artifact um, in the, in what it symbolically represents, it, everybody that, that was victimized here um, is really powerful. And this absolute last one is the... Um, uh, photo taken um at the very end um at the after you've gone to the um down to the crematoria and the gas chamber and seen that at burke now and that's the end of the railway tracks right you know past the gate of death right where this whole thing would have stopped and it's written in about 50 different languages and what it says in english is 
Forever let this place be a cry of despair and a warning to humanity, where the Nazis murdered about one and a half million men, women, and children, mainly Jews from various countries of Europe. Auschwitz-Birkenau, 1940 to 1945. Um, and it really speaks to, like, you know, basically humanity as a memorial to everything that happened here. And the different languages give us an idea of all that it's trying to speak to and all that it's trying to say of, you know, never again. So we hope that you guys have found this tour through Auschwitz educational. Um, during the course of this time, Athena and I hope to do this um, with some other topics. Um, some integrated this. lectures. Yes. To hopefully continue on the learning, right, that, that will prevent this type of atrocity in the future. Yes. Um, enjoy um, your... I guess time, time, Corona time. I don't know the best word for it. Right. Corona break time. I mean, yes. We hope that you're getting healthy. Yes. And resting, and you know that you still take this time to remember what's important. Yes, and hopefully we'll talk to you guys if not see you soon. Bye. Bye.